Hello everyone, my name is Stephanie Espy and welcome to our GMAP prep strategy session. I'm at the Goizueta Business School and just by introduction, I am a full I was a full-time two-year full, um, MBA student here and I finished Goizueta in 2008 and I'm very excited to say that I love the school so much that I'm back here in this capacity to help you guys conquer the GMAT. So we're going to have a lot of fun over the next hour together. Um, feel free to take some notes. However, you will receive a copy of the slides today. Um, you also can reach out to me after our presentation if you have any follow-up questions about anything. Um, but just to introduce you to the GMAT, um, the GMAT consists of four different sections. So you have your analytical writing section. That's a 30-minute section, as you see on the screen there. You also have um, a what's called integrated reasoning section. That section is also 30 minutes. It consists of data presented in tables and charts and graphs that you'll have to analyze and answer questions both qualitatively as well as quantitatively. Um, for that section only, there's a, there is an on-screen calculator at the top right of your screen. So you can use that calculator to do any math calculations that you need. Um, after those two sections, you have a break followed by the quantitative section, um, and then another break, and then lastly, the verbal section. So those are the four different sections that you have. And I will note also that those sections are interchangeable. So when you sit for your GMAT, you'll be able to select the order of how you um, take the test. You can take it in that exact order, or you can have the verbal section first, followed by the quant section, and end with the writing and the reasoning, or you can have the verbal section in the middle, the quant first, writing reasoning at the end. So really there's three different groupings there and you can order your tests in any way that you would like. And that's a, a relatively new feature to the GMAT. Traditionally it's been um, set where you have the writing and reasoning first, followed by the quant, and then lastly the verbal section. Um, so just to introduce, introduce you a little bit more to the verbal section, there are three different question types on the verbal section. Um, you have your critical reasoning question types. These are really fun because they really um, remind you of when you get together with your cousins and, and extended family around the Thanksgiving holidays or Christmas holidays, and you have debates back and forth with each other about an issue that you are really passionate about. So think of this question type as supporting or weakening an argument. So you're either trying to support or strengthen your position on an argument or you're trying to weaken or undermine someone else's position about an argument. So these are really, really fun, I think, question types um, that you'll have some practice with. Um, secondly, you have the sentence correction question type and that one is really based on grammar rules. So you should have a very solid foundation of the rules for standard written English, including things like subject verb agreement, um, pronouns and nouns, modifiers, verb tense, et cetera, and you'll have to correct sentences based on those rules. Um, choice A is always a repeat of the original sentence, but choices B, C, D, and E, the last four choices are variations of the sentence that you want to choose, um, which one corrects any errors presented to you in the question. So make sure for that section that you spend some time reviewing grammar rules and also um, making sure that you have a very thorough understanding of what written English is all about. And then lastly, you have your reading comprehension question type. And this one, again, is, is something that you probably are familiar with because in your everyday lives, you are avid readers, whether you read online, whether you read different journal articles or newspaper articles or books, et cetera. Your, your idea here is to have a, pa you have a passage that you have to read pretty quickly and then you have different questions that you have to answer based on the passage that is presented to you. The good news is that the passage will stay on the screen the entire time, and then you'll have questions one by one on the other side of the screen that you have to answer based on that passage. Um, so in total, you have um, 36 questions in the verbal section, and you have 65 minutes to answer those 36 questions. Um, so a summary of the verbal section. Now to move on to the quant section, which is what we're gonna spend most of our time today talking about. Um, for the quant section, you have two question types. You have your problem solving questions, which is your traditional um, question that you're kind of used to from maybe the SAT or the ACT or any other test you've taken before, where you have to solve a question within a certain time frame, roughly two minutes per question here, and then answer the question and choosing the best answer, or choosing the answer for the particular question. 
Okay, so the second type of question here is the data sufficiency. And this question is um, type is unique to the GMAT. If you've never taken the GMAT before, make sure you give yourself plenty of time to get acclimated with the data sufficiency question type because it is, um, again, something that's unique to this test. And for this question type, you'll have to, you'll be presented with a statement um, in the form of a question, either a yes or no question or a value question. So a yes or no question could be something like, is John older than Mary? That would be a yes or no. And then a value question would be something like, how old is John or how old is Mary? And then after that, you have two different statements, statement one and statement two, which present you with information or data that you'll have to analyze and taking that into consideration with what's given to you, assess if you have enough information to actually answer the question. So unlike the problem solving question type, this question type is not really asking you to solve anything, it's really asking you to determine whether you have enough information to solve the question. So that's very, very different from problem solving. And because these questions are interchangeable, um, sorry, they are, they're going back and forth throughout the test. So you may have um, problem solving question type followed by data sufficiency and rotate back and forth throughout the entire section. Or you may have two of one kind, two of another kind, then one of the, one of the other kind and kind of rotate back and forth. So in total you have 31 questions, 62 minutes, and those 31 questions are a combination of data sufficiency question types and problem solving question types. Roughly about half and half, but obviously you'll have a little bit more of one than the other. Um, it just really depends upon your test as to which one you have more of. Um, the GMAT is the tonic test that you cannot skip and, and move on to um, different questions. You can't go back to questions that you had previously. So you, should, you do have to answer them in the order that they appear on the screen. So because of that, it's important that you um, take the time you need for the question that's currently on your screen because that question has a bigger weighted value than anything that comes afterwards. Um, so these questions are not equally weighted, again, such as the SAT or the ACT. They are progressing in difficulty based on how you perform. So if you get a question correct, then you'll have a harder question that follows. If you get a question incorrect, then you'll have an easier question that follows. So it's not about rushing through the entire test to get to the very end. It's about answering them as correctly as they appear on your screen so that the question that comes next will be more, more challenging, which indicates that you are progressing in difficulty because you are answering those questions correctly. So what I wanna do for our next um, 50 minutes or so is go through some sample questions with you. Um, these are all questions presented in the 2018 official GMAT study guide book. So it's the pink version of the book. Um, there are several versions of the book out there by the G GMAC. Um, the questions I'm referring to today are presented in the 2018 version. If you have an older version, or even if you have the 2019 version that just came out, that's perfectly fine as well. Um, these books are very similar. They don't really change a lot from year to year. But just so we can stay on the same page about the question number, I'll call that out to you. Just know I'm taking this from the 2018 version of the book. All right, so we're ready for the first question. And this question is problem solving number 175. So again, 2018 book. And the question reads, if P is the product of all the integers from one to 30, inclusive, what is the greatest integer K for which three to the power of K is a factor of P? So that's a very loaded question. And I will say this is a 500 level question roughly. So this could be the first question you see on your GMAT. Um, so they tell us that P is a product. So that means P is the, is the product, is the multiplication of a series of numbers. They say from one all the way to 30. So that's one times two times three times four times five all the way to 30. And inclusive means including the one and including the 30, okay? And it says, what is the greatest integer K so greatest integer k for which 3 to the power of k is a factor of this product p. So we first have to identify what these key terms in the problem indicate. So integer, hopefully you remember the definition of integer, is really a whole number. So we know that k is a whole number. and when it represents this, when it looks to say three to the power of k, written as an exponent, that means that k is 
the number of threes that we have that are factors of P. So for example, if K was two, that means we have two threes. And if K was three, that means that we have three threes, okay? So K tells you the number of threes that you have, and you wanna know how many threes are factor. Another word for factor is divisor. So how many threes can be divided or divisors of this product P? So to figure that out, what we need to look at more closely is the factors of P from one to 30, and which of these factors can be divided by three? Which of these factors are multiples of three? Because only the multiples of three are going to have factors of three. So that would include three, six, nine, 12, 15, 18, 21, 24, 27, and 30. So these are the only factors of three in this product P. And so again, we're trying to figure out how many threes we have. So what we need to do is factor out all these factors of three, and then we can count the, numbers of, the number of threes that we factor, and that will tell us what K is equal to. So we have a factor of three there, and the number six we have three times two, so we have one factor of three there. And the number nine we have three times three, so we have two factors of three there. And the number 12 we have three times four, so there's a factor of three there. And 15 we have three times five, and 18 we have three times six, and then six of course is two times three. And 21 we have three times seven, and 24 we have three times eight. 27 we have three times nine, and nine is three times three, so three factors of three there. And then lastly in 30 we have three times 10, one factor of three there. So in total we were to count the, numbers of th the number of threes that we have, we can do that. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, which indicates that K is equal to 14. All right, so just to re recap this question, where we're given a product, we don't have a calculator, so it's important that you um, realize there's a way to solve this question without actually doing all the math. And to do that, we just indicate which of these um, factors are multiples of three. We list out all the multiples of three, and then we need to figure out how many threes we have that are factors of those multiples. Um, the fact that this number three is a prime number or prime integer is really important here because if this wasn't three, if it was something more like um, like four, for example, or or eight, something that wasn't prime, we would have a tough time calculating those. Um, the number of factors of that number because that number is not prime. It's, it's composite, which means that you can break that number down into other numbers. So having this number be a three or a five or a seven or 11 or anything that's prime is really the only way we can solve this question um, because once you have the number three, it can't factor, you can't break it down into anything else outside of one in itself, okay? So that's a good example of a 500 level GMAT question, one that you're likely to see as one of your first few questions on the test. Um, and the key concepts here are products, so knowing what a product means, knowing what the word integer means, knowing what an exponent tells us, so what that means, and knowing what a factor or a divisor is, and then taking this product and then factoring it down to figure out how many of those factors you have within that product. All right, <clears throat> so we're gonna move on to another question. And for the next question, we're going to look at problem solving number 211. So let me just write that here. Problem solving 211. Again, this is the 2018 version of the GMAT book. And this question says that we have seven pieces of rope with an average mean of 68 centimeters. And a median length of 84 centimeters. So let me write that down. We have an average length of 68 centimeters, and we have a median length of 84 centimeters. And we have seven pieces of rope. So I'm gonna indicate those seven pieces of rope with seven lines. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pieces of rope. The median, which is the number in the middle, so this one 
is 84. And if the average is 68, and we have seven pieces of rope, we know that average is equal to the sum divided by the number. Okay? So our average, they told us, is 68. We don't know the sum. That's what we're trying to figure out. And we know that we have seven pieces of rope, so we can divide that by seven. And now we can calculate our sum. So we know our sum is going to equal 68 times 7. So that's the math that we have to do. 68 times 7 without a calculator. 8 times 7 is 56. 6 times 7 is 42. 42 plus 5, 476. So our sum, 476. So if we add it up, all these seven pieces of rope, we'll have a sum that's 476. 76. All right, so I'm going to erase this and let's keep reading the question. So it says that if the length of the longest piece of rope is 14 centimeters more than four times the length of the shortest pieces of piece of rope. So we have our longest pieces of rope here. Let's call this the longest and let's call this one over here the shortest. All right. So let's say the shortest piece of, rope, piece of rope is S for shortest. The longest, they say, is 14 centimeters longer than four times the shortest. So that means four times the shortest is 4S plus 14 will be the longest piece of rope. Okay? So then the question asks us, what is the maximum, so that's the keyword, the maximum possible length of the longest piece of rope. So we want to maximize the longest piece of rope. In order to maximize the longest piece, we need to think about how we can minimize, minimize these other pieces here. Okay? So if, we're, if we know that this middle piece is the median, and we know that S represents the shortest piece of rope, the shortest length, then what will be the smallest value we can put in this place in order to minimize these six pieces to maximize the seventh piece. So to minimize this piece here, it would be exactly what the shortest piece of rope is. So if this is S, whatever that value is, this um, next piece will also be equal to S. Similarly, this third piece will also be equal to S. Okay? And then we hit our median, the 84. So then when we think about what the minimal, the, the smallest possible value for this next piece is, it will be exactly equal to the median, so that would be 84. Similarly, this next piece will also be equal to 84. So now we have successfully minimized these six pieces of rope in order to find the maximum length for the longest pieces of rope. Okay? So let's create an equation now. We have S plus S plus S, so that's three S's plus 84 plus 84 plus 84, that's 384s, plus our longest piece of rope, 4S plus 14, equaling the sum of the seven pieces, 476. So we can do this math. So we have 4S's here, 3S's here, so that's 7S's. 3 times 84, we can come over to the side and figure that out. 3 times 84, that's 12, that's 25, so 252. And then plus our 14 equals our 476. All right? So then lastly, we can combine the 252 and the 14. So it's F7S plus, that's what, 266. If I did my math right, 4 plus 2 is 6. 5 and 1 is 6 equals 476. Subtracting 266 on both sides. We know that 7S's is, is going to equal, what is that, 210. And then our last step is divide both sides by 7. So dividing by 7 yields our final result there. That S is equal to 30. Okay? So we now we know our shortest piece is 30. But the question is asking us for the longest piece of rope. So we plug in 30 for S. And so when we plug in 30 for S, we get... 4 times 30 plus 14 
which is 120 plus 14, which will give us our final answer of 134. All right, so the maximum length of this last piece of rope is 134 centimeters. Our shortest piece, the, the, the minimal length of our shortest piece is 30 centimeters. So to recap, we had a question that gave us an average, which we know is the sum of all of our values divided by the number of values. And then we were given our median, which is the number right in the middle. We illustrated our seven pieces of rope with just seven different lines. And then we figured out how to minimize the six pieces so that we could maximize the longest piece, the seventh piece. And then from that point on, we were able to solve for the shortest piece and then plug in and solve for the longest piece. All right? Okay. We're going to keep moving along. I want to make sure that we have some time to get to some data sufficiency questions because, as I mentioned before, those questions are unique to the GMAT. And we want to be sure that you all have some exposure to what that looks like. Okay. So the next question we're going to look at is problem solving number 221. So problem solving 221. And again, this is from the 2018 GMAT book. And this question reads, Xavier, Yvonne, and Zelda each try independently to solve a problem. So we have three people. We have Xavier, we have Yvonne, and we have Zelda. And they're each trying to solve a problem independently. And then it says that their individual probabilities for success, so for success, are one quarter, one half, and five eighths respectively. Respectively meaning in that order. And so because we know their chance for success, we can also figure out their chance for not success. Okay? So the opposite of success, we'll say, is not success. So we know that for Xavier, if his chance for success is one out of four, then his chance for not success is three out of four. For Yvonne, if her chance for success is one over two, her chance for not success is also one over two or 50%. And for Zelda, if her chance for success is five over eight, then her chance for not success will be three over eight, okay? So we have all of our probabilities here. So now we can see what the question's asking for. And it says, what is the probability that Xavier and Yvonne, so Xavier and Yvonne, but not Zelda, so and not Zelda. Okay, so it's Xavier and Yvonne and not Zelda, okay? So whenever we have an and, we want this and this and this to happen, we multiply probabilities together. If instead we had an or versus an and, if we had Xavier or Yvonne or Zelda, we would then add probabilities together. But in this case, we want three different things to happen. And because we want all three to happen, we multiply probabilities together. So we multiply Xavier's chance for success, that's one quarter. Yvonne's chance for not success, that's one half. Sorry, for success is one half. And not Zelda, which means not success, which is three over eight, three eighths. So taking the one quarter, multiplying that by the one half, and multiplying that by the three eighths, will yield our result, which is three over 64. Okay, so that's an example of a probability question, problem solving question. The key here is to make sure that you write out all your information. I love tables. Tables and charts and diagrams are great because they help you kind of keep your information organized. Um, and then once you have everything organized in a table or a diagram or some kind of visual representation, you can then figure out what you need in order to solve the problem. Okay? All right. So I want to spend some time talking about data sufficiency now because, again, this question type is unique to the GMAT. And for those of you listening today that have never taken the GMAT, I want to make sure you're familiar with the directions 
for this type of question and also how to look at the answer choices. If you've taken the GMAT before, or you've taken a practice test before, you should be very familiar with this. Um, it is a new idea, a new concept, but it's something that once you get into your study regimen, it, is, um, it should become second nature very quickly. So to start, your answer choices, A, B, C, D, and E, for this part of the test, indicate very different things. So choice A means that statement one is sufficient, but not statement two, but not two, okay? So we'll get into what I mean by statement one and statement two in a moment, but state, statement one is sufficient, meaning you have sufficient information, but not the second statement. Choice B is the opposite of that. Statement two is sufficient, but not statement one, okay? Choice C means that neither of these statements is sufficient. So one and two are insufficient independently, but if you have them together, then they are sufficient. So independently, I should write that, independently, they are not sufficient, but if you take them both together, they are sufficient. So you need them both to answer the question. Choice D means that one and two are both sufficient independently. So again, one by itself is sufficient, two by itself is sufficient, they're both sufficient independently. You don't need them together, they're both sufficient by themselves. And then lastly, choice E means basically you need more information. Need more info. Statement one is insufficient, statement two is insufficient, and when you put them together, you're still insufficient. So at that point, you need more information. You can't answer the question, you need something else to be able to answer the question. So these are our five answer choices. Um, you also have an illustration of a t this information in the table format on your screen where you see kind of how we go through answer choices. So I'll, I'll review that very quickly before we get into a sample question. And again, if you're unfamiliar with this part of the test, I guarantee you that once you start preparing and studying for this test, this will become very much second nature for you. So on this um, diagram, you see that you have initial question, is statement one sufficient? That's your first question. If your answer is yes, then what you wanna do is you want to eliminate B, C, and E, okay? So if you set up your answer choices as in two columns, A, D on one side and B, C, E on the other side, if this statement is not is sufficient, we eliminate B, C, and E. And then you ask yourself another question. Is statement two sufficient? And if it is sufficient, then your answer is D. And if it's not sufficient, your answer is A. All right? So you'll be done with that particular question based on that. If the answer to statement one being sufficient is no from the right side of that diagram, then you have the same two columns. And if statement one is not sufficient, you eliminate the first column, AD. And so now we have three choices to consider. So your second question is a statement two sufficient. And if you answer this question yes, your answer is B and you're done with the question. However, if you answer this question no, then at this point and only this point do you consider statements one and two together. Okay, you put them both together. If together they're sufficient, so is or are statement one and two together sufficient is the question here. If the answer is yes, you choose C. If the answer is no, you choose E. Okay, so here's our strategy. Here's our process elimination for data sufficiency question types. 
And we always set up our paper, our, our each question, with our A, D, B, C, E, so that we can analyze one column at a time to figure out if that statement is sufficient or not, and that will help us determine which of those columns to eliminate. All right, so now that we have that in our heads, and we know what the A, B, C, D, E mean, let's look at a sample question. All right, so we're looking at question number 349. And this is, again, in your 2018 book. Question 349. So let me put that here. DS, that's efficiency 349. And the question reads, is the positive two-digit integer n, okay? So what we're given, G stands for given in this case. We're given that we have a positive Positive, of course, means bigger than zero. Two-digit, and to review, a digit is a single number. So there's only 10 digits in total. Zero is the lowest, and nine is the biggest, right? So zero to nine. So we have a positive two-digit integer. An integer we know is a whole number, and we call it n. So n is going to equal two digits. Let's call this first digit T for our tens digit, tens place. And the second digit, let's call this U for a units place. Okay, so the GMAT calls the, the units place or the ones place um, units. You probably heard of it or familiar with it from grade school as ones place, but we want to use a U for units place here. So we don't know what T is, we don't know what U is, but we know that N is two digits and we can represent each digit with a variable. Okay, and the question is, is this integer n less than 40? So that's what we're trying to find. F stands for find. We want to find is, is n less than 40, right? So this is a yes or no question. Okay, so now we're ready to move on and look at our first statement. But first let's write our AD. BCE, we want to keep that in mind as we go into our first statement. And our first statement says that the units digit, which we called U, is, which means equals, it is six more, so we're going to add six, six more than the tens digit. So six more than T. All right? So the units digit is six more than the tens digit, which we call T. So let's put this into a table where we have T and U, and then we have N, all right? So if T was equal to one, it can't be zero, because if T was zero, we would not have a two-digit integer. We would just have a one-digit integer. So the smallest that T could be is one. If T was one, we plugged in one here, one plus six will give us seven, and our value for n will be 17. Is 17 less than 40? Absolutely. So the answer, answer to our question based on this information is yes. All right, what about if t was two? If t was two, we plug in two here, two plus six is eight, and the value for n will be 28, and yet, yet again, that's a value under 40. If t was equal to three, we plug in three for t, three plus six is nine. Our value for n would be 39. And yet again, we are under 40. So we have yes, yes, yes. So it looks like our answer is gonna be yes, but let, we didn't explore the options yet. What happens when t is four, okay? If we plug in t to be four, we get four plus six, which is 10. And that's a problem because u has to be a single digit. And 10 is not a single digit. 10 is a double digit, it's two digits. So therefore, T cannot be four, anything larger than four, because then U would be a double digit, double digits um, number. So these are only three options for N, 17, 28, and 39. And all three options are under 40. So we have answered this question with confidence that is N less than 40? Yes, yes, yes it is. Therefore, we eliminate B, C, and E, 
And now we have to analyze statement two to figure out if our answer is going to be A, which is statement one by itself, or D, which is statement one and two independently are sufficient. All right, so just like for statement one, we're going to, I'm going to erase this, we're going to look at statement two and see what we can determine from statement two. So statement two says that N is, so that means N equals four less, so take away four, four less, than four times the unit's digit. So N is four less than four times our unit's digit. So just like last time, let's make a table. In this table, we're going to plug in values for u. And there's no t in the equation, so we're going to have values for u and then values for n. OK. So if u was 0, which is the lowest possible value for u, the, low, the smallest digit, we would end up with a negative value. So that doesn't make any sense. If u was 1, we'll have 4 minus 4 which is 0, but we don't want n to be 0 because n is supposed to be a two-digit number, so that doesn't make any sense. If n was, if u was 2, that would be an 8 here, 8 minus 4, but again, n should be two digits, so that doesn't make any sense. So we could keep going on, but what I'm thinking right now is because we're getting so many values on the low end that don't work, that are too small for n, let's just skip to our largest value for for you. So the largest value that you could be is 9 because that's our largest single digit. So if u was 9, 9 times 4 would give us 36, and 36 minus 4 would give us 32, a value for, of 32 for n. And this is the largest possible value for n because we chose the largest possible digit for u. And that, of course, is less than 40, so yes, it is, which means that every other possibility for n is also less than 40. So we're sufficient there as well. We, to eliminate A, we choose D as our answer. So both of these statements independently is sufficient to answer our question. And notice that we never found the value for N. We, didn't, we don't know exactly what N is. We could figure it out. We could take another minute or two to figure that out. But because it's a time test, we only have two minutes per question on average, we really want to stop when we have enough information. So we know that based on this, based on this information, N is less than 40. We don't want to keep going and actually find the value for n, but this is what we, what we, all we need to do to answer this question. All right? So that's a, a good example of a data sufficiency question type. Um, this one deals with digits. It deals with positive, making sure that you know what a positive integer is, what an integer is, and representing digits with variables. Um, and each of these digits represents a different place value. Okay? So I'm going to erase this one, and we're going to move on and do another example. And this next example is, once again, in your 2018 GMAT book. It is problem number 300, 378. That's sufficiency 378. And um, this one's a word problem. So Anytime you're given a word problem, it's important to read it, write down what you know, and if you can draw a visual of the problem, something to see what's going on, that's a good idea as well. So we're going to do that for this problem. So it says a certain bookcase has two shelves of books. All right, so we have two shelves. So I'm going to indicate the two shelves with these two lines. And it says we have an upper shelf, so let's call this the upper shelf. The upper shelf has... Um, the book with the greatest number of pages is 400 pages. So if we're going to have several books on this shelf, right, here are the books. And if we put these books in order, the book with the greatest number of pages, this book on the end, has 400 pages. So we're going to put a 400 right there. We don't know how many books we have in total. But all we know, all we know so far is that the one on the very end of the shelf, if we organize them from least number of pages to greatest number of pages, the book on the very end of the shelf has 400 pages, has 400 pages there. And then we have um, the lower shelf, so we'll call this L for lower. And this one also has so many books, we don't know how many books we have, right? But what we do know is that the book with the least number of pages 
So this one, let's say we put these in order, and the one over here with the smallest or the least number of pages is 475. Okay. So we have our visual representation of the upper shelf with the greatest number of pages at the end of the shelf and the lower shelf with the least number of pages here. And notice that the least number of pages here is greater than the greatest number of pages here. All right? So the question is asking us, this is our given information. So going back to the G and the F, our given and our find. What we're trying to find in this case is the median number of pages. So the median number of pages for all the books, all the books on the two shelves. So if we took all the books to, and we put them on one shelf, for example, which book would be in the middle based on the number of pages? So put all the books on one shelf, we put them in order from least to greatest number of pages, what's going to be right in the middle? So if we were to do that visually and we put our book with 400 pages right next to the book with 475 pages, we're combining the upper shelf with the lower shelf, we're putting them on one shelf. These two books will be right next to each other, 400 pages, 475 pages. We want to know of all the books on the two shelves, what's going to be right in the middle, what's going to be the median. Okay, so that is the question that we're being asked. And when we look at these questions, we want to make sure we understand the problem statement and what we're trying to find before we actually get into this, the statements there. So we have A, D, B, C, E, right, our answer choices. And now we're prepared to, to look at and analyze statement one. Okay, so statement one says that there are 25 books on the upper shelf. So now we have information about the number of books we have on the shelf. So there are 25 books on the upper shelf, okay? So if we look at this upper shelf, we know that this is one of those 25 which means we have 24 to the left of this 25th book. And that's helpful information, but we know absolutely nothing about the lower shelf. So with this by itself, we're insufficient. We need more information. So we can eliminate A and D. Okay? Statement two now tells us that we have 24 books on the lower shelf. So 24 books on the lower shelf. All right, so looking at this lower shelf, we know that this is one of the 24. So it means we have 23 books to the right of that book. So we have the, four, the book that has 475 pages, and then we have 23 to the right of it. But again, if we just look at this information by itself, without knowing statement one, we, would be in, we, we don't have enough information. Just knowing this information by itself is not enough. So therefore, we eliminate answer choice B. So at this point in time, we want to take them both together. All right? And together, we know that we have 24 books on the left of the book with 400 pages. So it's 25 total on the upper shelf. And then we have 23 on the right of the book with 475 pages. So that's 24 books all together on the lower shelf. So we know that we have 49 books in total. 49 is an odd number. So there should be that there should be one right in the middle that we can um, hopefully figure out. So if we look at this long list of this long um, the books all lined up together. We can clearly see that the 400 will be our median. Hopefully you can see that because you have 24 to its left, and you have 24 to its right. So 24 to the left, 24 to the right tells us that this book here is the one right in the middle of all the books on the shelf. So that will be our answer. Okay, 400. So we're sufficient. So therefore, we can eliminate E, and our answer will be C. With both pieces of information, one and two, we are sufficient to answer this question. I think for people who miss this question, it's because they don't have a good visual in their heads. I think that people end up choosing E more often um, than C because they can't picture these books all together on one shelf. 
and drawing it out so that you have them all together on one shelf is very helpful for you to hopefully see that even though you don't know how many pages these 24 books have, and even though you don't know how many pages these 23 books have, is really unnecessary information to find out the median, knowing that the 400 was the greatest and the 475 was the least on that shelf. So with this visual, hopefully that helps you to understand that we have all we need to figure out what the median is. Okay, I think we have time for maybe one more question. So I'm going to look at um, that's efficiency 386. All right, this is a really good example of a geometry question. So if you're following along in your GMAT books, the 2018 version of the book, this is going to be number 386. <clears throat> All right, and this question says that we have um, a right triangle. So we draw a right triangle like this. So the right triangle indicates we have a 90 degree angle. And this is the hypotenuse of a right triangle is 10 centimeters. So the hypotenuse is always the, the longest length of the triangle that's opposite of the 90 degree angle. And it tells us that this hypotenuse is 10 centimeters long. And the question, so this is our given, our question what we're trying to find, <coughs> excuse me, is what is the perimeter, perimeter of this triangle? So by definition, perimeter means adding up the three different sides. Perimeter is adding up all the sides, but in this case, because we have a triangle, is adding up the three sides. So we have 10 plus whatever this value is x plus whatever this value is y. So perimeter would be 10 plus x plus y. All right, so in order to be sufficient here, we need to know the value for x and the value for y. Okay, so I'm going to put our A, D, B, C, E up here. And we're ready for statement one. So statement one says that the area, so let's be reminded what area is. Area is what you can fill inside of the triangle, right? Everything inside of it is the area. The equation for area of a triangle is one half base times height. And the base of the triangle in this case is Y. We can identify that as y. So it's 1 half y times our height, we called it x. So area is 1 half y times x. And it tells the area of this triangle is 25 square centimeters. So it equals 25. All right? Now, one thing I want to note, and we should go back a little bit to, to indicate this, is that whenever you have a right triangle, right triangles um, have special properties. And one of the properties that applies to right triangle is something called the Pythagorean theorem, which indicates that um, the two legs, if you take each of the legs and you square them, and you add the squares together, you'll equal the hypotenuse squared. So usually you see that written as a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Okay, hopefully you've seen that before. Where a and b are the legs, or the smallest lengths of the triangle, and C is your hypotenuse. C is always your hypotenuse, okay? So in this particular problem, our legs are X and Y, so X squared plus Y squared, and our hypotenuse is 10, so 10 squared is 100. So this equation here is part of our given information. Because we were given we had a right triangle, we should also note that this equation, Pythagorean theorem, is also a given equation. So when we consider the first um, statement here, statement one, which is 25 equals one half x times y, we should consider it knowing that we have the Pythagorean theorem to use as well. So here, and we can simplify this to 50 equals x times y. If we're given that 50 is x times y, and we're given that x squared plus y squared equals 100, we have, in essence, two equations, and we have two variables. And with two equations and two variables, we can solve for x and we can solve for y. And once we have solved, we can plug in those values, whatever they may be, 
to get our perimeter. So note that we don't actually need to solve. We don't actually have to do the work, right? We've done enough work to know that we have enough information to solve. And with that, we can stop with confidence and say we are sufficient with two equations, with two variables, we can solve, we eliminate BCE. Okay, and that is something that if you're new to data sufficiency question types, it's probably gonna be a little bit tough for you to wrap your mind around initially, stopping at the point where you know you can solve and not doing too much work that that loses time when you could move on to something else, all right? So we're gonna move on to the second statement now. And the second, second statement says that the two legs, so again, the legs are the, the um, shortest lengths of the triangle, the two legs, X and Y, it says they are of equal length. So X is equal to Y. So that's really important information because now we know that we have this triangle, this right triangle with a hypotenuse of 10, we know that both of the legs are equal. This is a special triangle. It's not just a right triangle, it's a special right triangle. Whenever you have legs of the same length, that indicates that the opposite angles, these two angles here are also of the same measure, and they're both 45 degrees because we know that the sum of the angles in a triangle is 180, and if we take the 180, the 90 away from the 180, the sum of the other two angles is 90, and because they're equal, we know that they're both 45 degrees. So this is a 45, 45, 90 special right triangle. Um, this is something that you definitely learned in um, probably ninth grade geometry, 45, 45, 90 special right triangles. So definitely go back and review that if you, if you don't remember. There's another special right triangle called a 30, 60, 90 special right triangle. But in this problem, we, we're not dealing with that one. We're only dealing with this, problem, with this type of right triangle. So this tells us that because of the special relationship between the sides and because we're given one of the sides, we can solve for the other two sides. And because we can solve for the other two sides, we can plug into our equation for perimeter and we can solve for the perimeter. So once again, we are sufficient. So we eliminate A and we choose D in this case, okay? Let's say we did not know our special right triangles, which you definitely should know them because there's some questions on the test where you absolutely must know them. But in this particular question, we could have used what we know about Pythagorean theorem to help us out with the second statement. So knowing that X and Y are equal, we know that X squared plus X squared is 10 squared. So X squared plus X squared is 10 squared or 100. And based on that, we can also see that we have enough information to solve because we can add these X squared terms together, they're like terms, and then we can solve for X and then we can find our perimeter, okay? So the key to this question, I think, is one, definitely review your, your geometry because geometry is probably one of the subjects that you are less familiar with in terms of, you know, when you learn the information. Pr probably you haven't seen this since high school for most of you, um, and that's okay because everything you learn in geometry class is not tested on the GMAT. There's only a small fraction of geometry concepts tested on the GMAT. Um, but the, ge the geometry that you're expected to know, such as triangles and circles and quadrilaterals, um, they will not give you the equations that you need for this test, so you have to know them. You have to go back and review them in order to be able to know what the equation for area is, to know what Pythagorean theorem is, to know about your special right triangles, etc. So make sure you take the time to, re to review geometry. Um, again, not all geometry is tested on this exam, but there are enough concepts that you want to go back and make sure you have a fundamental understanding of the concepts that are tested on the GMAT. So to wrap up, um, I could go on and on and on, of course. Um, we could do literally all these problems together that are in the official GMAT study guidebook, but I recommend that you do that on your own. So the best way to prepare for this test is to take practice tests and to do the practice problems written by the official test makers. That's the GMAC, the Graduate Management Admissions Council. They write the test, they write the practice test questions that are very similar to what you're gonna see when you go into for your real test. So make sure you have a copy of that 2018 official GMAT study guidebook. Make sure you go into their GMAT website, the GMAC website, gmac.com or mba.com, 
and download their GMAT prep software, which is free to download onto your computers, whether you have a Mac or a PC. Download that onto your computers and take those online practice tests. I recommend you do that as soon as possible. If you've never taken the GMAT before, you've never had a practice test before, please, 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 the best thing you can do for yourself is to dive in head first into the pool of cold water, right? It's a little bit scary, but go ahead and just sit for a practice test just to get your feet wet, just to know what you're dealing with. That's gonna help you tremendously to realize where you are today before you continue your studying, before you even get started with your studying, where you are today, and how far are you from your target score, where you're trying to be, where your goal is, right? So if your goal is to get a 750 GMAT so that you can get lots of scholarships and you'll, you know, you'll get financial um, assistance via scholarships, then you absolutely want to know where you are so that you know how far you are from your goal. And that will help you figure out also how to best prepare for this test, whether or not you need to um, find a study partner and spend some hours with a, per with a, bu a buddy to help you kind of help each other out, whether you need to enroll in a course, um, whether you need to uh, seek the help of a one-on-one -on -one coach to help you um, increase your score by 200 points or whatever you need to increase it by. But you really need to have a plan. I think that's really, really important to have a plan. And the plan starts with where you are today and where you're trying to get to, what your goal is. And that could take you a month, it could take you two months, it could take you a whole year. It really depends upon you and how much time you have dedicated to this test and how much, um, you know, what your resources look like to prepare for this test. Um, there is no one kind of size fits all sort of approach to it. Um, but I will kind of wrap up by saying that uh, this is something I'm very, very passionate about. And if you, if you would like, feel free to reach out to me. You can visit my website, which is mathsp.com. Um, I have both small group courses as well as boot camp type of courses that um, are available for you. So feel free to, to look up those up, look up the dates and things like that on the website. Feel free to email any questions to info, I-N-F-O, at mathsp.com. We do specialize in the math part of the test, but we also um, assist with the verbal section as well. Verbal is more so for those people who feel like they really need strategies with the reading comprehension section as well as the critical reasoning and the sentence correction. We teach you more of those strategies there. But for the quantitative, we're, we're really trying to make sure you have the foundation that you need and make sure you're reviewing all the concepts that you need to master that part of the test. And then we apply that foundation and those concepts to real GMAT test questions written in by the GMAC in that official study guidebook. So I want to thank you all so much for your attention today. Thank you for tuning in to this webinar. Hopefully you gain some valuable tips and tools and strategies of how to approach these questions. Um, if you haven't yet started studying, the time is now. If you've already started your preparation, um, again, keep that going and, then, and we'll look to see you next time. Thanks so much for joining us.